Facebook with Professor Stephen Tafe of Stephen F. Austin State University in, I know I'm going to mispronounce it, <laughs> Na- Nacogdoches. 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 Nacogdoches, Texas. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> Pretty close, like something you want to eat a plate of (laughs) with cheese. That's right. And jelly. (laughs) And it's funny that, um, Steve, you you have a brand new book out, but we're not talking about it. (laughs) Glenn, you're going to mention it, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. His prior books and the new book. Yeah. He needs that two bucks per sale. (laughs) How is he going to get a Starbucks coffee if he doesn't, you know? That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's it will get you one fourth of Starbucks coffee. <laughs> um, oh, this is great. We have all our all our uh, World War II aficionados showing up here in the waiting room and it is seven o'clock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my sound, my computer audio, and I'm going to start our theme music and then let everybody in from the waiting room. So here we go. If you have some patience, I will find, I know I had it here. <laughs> I will find the, okay, dun dun dun. here we go. Oh, here we go. Yep, here is our theme music. You'll like it. Big band entertainment. Here we go. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Veterans Breakfast Club Greatest Generation Live. I am Todd, and I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club, and we are a nonprofit here in in Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh area, but we've been doing these online programs for uh, over a year and a half now, And, uh, and it's great because we've just expanded the kind of programming that we've been doing, and one of our programs has to do with everything around World War II. And uh, the host for this program is Glenn Flickinger. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Todd. Good evening, everybody. Um, Glenn lives about uh, two, three miles away, maybe from me, maybe four miles, maybe. Yeah, Yeah, something like that down the road. And uh, we are here in Western Pennsylvania, where it is uh, like the last day above 80 degrees. And we're kicking into fall tomorrow, the first full day of fall. So welcome everybody, uh, first full first night of fall. And um, I'm just gonna throw it to you, Glenn, because I'm gonna be letting people in here from the waiting room and then also following up on comments in the chat here and on the Facebook side. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. It's great to uh, see everybody, those of you I can see. Uh, I think we've got an interesting uh, program tonight because I have a very interesting guest, uh, his book, Marshall and his generals. Uh, I picked up, uh, I, I, I think I read or, or heard a podcast review of it originally years ago uh, and uh, was fascinated by the title because oh, so fascinated by World War II and its generals. So I picked up a copy, read it, and uh, uh, enjoyed it tremendously. And then when we got started here with The Greatest Generation Live and uh, me being the host and producer, um, I immediately thought of getting the author on uh, the program. And tonight, there he is, Stephen R. Tafe from, if I get this right now, Steve, Stephen Austin, Stephen F. Austin University in, I'm a, now this is the big one, Nacogdoches. How do Nacogdoches. Do Say that again. Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches. Okay. Nacogdoches. Nacado- and it's Stephen F. Austin State University, Glenn. Oh, Correct. Sorry, I forgot the state. My, <laughs> um, Steve is actually uh, uh, almost a local boy. Steve, uh, you grew up where? Youngstown, Ohio. There we go. There we go. Now, unfortunately, he is, I think, a Cleveland fan. But true. 
We've had worse. We've had worse. <laughs> Hold it. I didn't. I I did not hear that. Oh. <laughs> yes, I am. Wow. Uh, okay. The program. All right. We'll do, we'll we'll overlook that. We'll overlook. You've got Ravens in the house too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, Steve, you went to uh, Grove City undergrad. Is that right? Many years ago. Many years ago, right? So uh, close by, obviously. And uh, where'd you go from there? Where'd you get the rest of your schooling? I did my graduate studies at Ohio University in Athens, no. not Ohio State. No, 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 no. Much better school, Ohio U. Yes. Oops, I just, just, I know, I just, I just uh, got somebody upset. I don't know who. <laughs> somebody. Okay. Uh, and how long have you been teaching there uh, in Texas? Uh, 20 years. 20 years. Wow. Okay. And you teach what? I teach American history surveys and American military history courses and American foreign policy. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, this is not the first book you've written about uh, generals uh, in our American wars. And let's see here. Let me share the screen again, uh, Todd. And, and so people can see uh, a few of these uh, pictures I've got up here. Uh, let me get to the right spot. So I think, uh, uh, Steve, was this your first book, Washington's Revolutionary War Generals? Uh, no, that's my seventh book. Seventh book. Well, was yeah. this the first book in this uh, with this theme? Uh, no, this is the first book chronologically about generals. Okay. okay. And then you also wrote basically one on the Civil War. Right. Uh, Army of the Potomac and the generals. Right. Correct. And, and of and, and, and of course, tonight we're, we're going to talk about not this book, but uh, Marshall and his generals. And just released just in the past couple of weeks is your newest book. Three days ago. Three days ago. There we go. So let's let's get a rush going to Amazon, folks. Pick this up before you run out. Um, and what is it about, Steve? It's about the Marine Corps generals who commanded the divisions and corps uh, during the Pacific War. Okay. Following the same theme of your previous books, and of course, the same theme of uh, uh, the U.S. Army ground generals uh, in World War II. Yeah, it's the same theme. I just plug in a different war each time. <laughs> it's easy. It's all on the word processor, right? <laughs> That's it's right. <laughs> A couple of nights, stay up late, and you got yourself another book. No, it's, I can guarantee you, having read it, uh, read his Marshall book anyway, and I'm going to get that, that Marine book very soon here. Um, it's an immense amount of research. Uh, it, it's incredibly impressive. Thank um, you. Talk a little bit about the methodology. So I think as we put in the announcement with the email, the, the VBC bulletin, there were, I think, 38 generals, U.S. Army Ground Force generals, who served in 32 of the senior high command positions. Is that correct? That sounds about right. Okay. Give or take. All right. Right. Okay. So how did you go about researching all these names, 38 names, and come up with such, such definitive characteristics of each one? Uh, well, what I did for most of these guys is I relied on memoirs. Many of them wrote their memoirs. So that took care of some of them. And I was looking for what they said about themselves and what they said about each other. And then uh, many of them have papers at uh, various archives, particularly the Army's uh, Military Education Center in Carlisle. So I went there and, and uh, trolled through the papers they had. And then the military has various reports uh, that you can look at in which generals uh, exchanged information about each other. And um, then often I'd find some of the staff officers who work with these guys and I'd read what they said about their commanders and guys the commanders knew. And when you put that all together, that usually, not always, but it usually gave me enough information to explain not only who they were, but why they got their position. You know, why is it that this guy got appointed to command a corps and not some other guy? Uh, some of them I don't know even now. There just isn't enough out there. But but most of them I could figure it out, and there was enough information. I wasn't able to get in uh, what's called their 201 files for most of them, which had their official files and their efficiency reports, because that's just 
to do that requires an immense amount of work contacting relatives then getting access assuming the information is even there because there's a big fire in st louis back in the 70s that destroyed a lot of those records so th those would be the sort of performance reviews of yeah those by higher ups right right ah that's interesting so you did not get their 201s uh in a couple cases i was i was able to because they were in their papers at the archives but for most of them no i couldn't same case with the Marine Corps? Uh, same thing with Marines, yeah. Those guys, in fact, I couldn't get any of their, I don't think I came across any of their, no, I scratched that. There were a couple, but generally speaking, no. Okay. So when you describe a general as uh, commanding, uh, creative, uh, uh, intelligent, um, whatever other adjectives you want to you throw out there, which you have quite a few with each general, those are not your words. Those are coming from these sources that you described. Yeah, I, I take almost all the characteristics of these guys from what other folks said about them. Right, right. Okay. Okay. That, that's what I found so uh, deeply interesting, right? And, and, and uh, most of the audience knows, and, and I've related this to Steve, and many of our members uh, came from corporate America or academic America, right? And, you know, there's an incredible analogy, not a perfect one, because in the, in the military, we're talking life and death during war. Uh, at Melvin Bank, it wasn't quite life and death, although it felt like it at times. <laughs> I could have killed a few people while I was there, that's for sure. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but the, there are certain analogies about, you know, uh, why certain people get promoted and others do not, you know, and, and what their characteristics are. Okay, so, so the thought here is uh, Steve and I are gonna talk for 10 or 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, many of you, I have about a, eight or 10 of you, uh, you are members, volunteered who you thought your top five uh, generals were in World War II. And we're gonna try to bring you in. If you're on the, the, the call tonight, uh, we're gonna try to bring you in and talk about uh, who you thought were the top generals. And those of you who didn't volunteer them already, if you just want to chime in when we get to that part, please do as to who you thought uh, the most successful generals were during World War II. Okay. So uh, I, let me share this again. We're, we're looking at uh, Marshall's uh, picture here. And um, uh, it all starts with, of course, George Marshall, right? Um, and, and what I found fascinating, uh, uh, Steve, is early on in the book, you, you talk about what was the criteria, what were the, the defining characteristics that Marshall looked for in his generals? How would you summarize what he was looking for? Uh, there are a number of things that he looked for. The first one is character and um, how he defined character changed a little bit as the war went on. But early on, he wanted guys that had integrity, that were honorable, that, that uh, intelligent men. Uh, as the war went on, he started to change and was looking for what he would call sturdy guys. He didn't necessarily want the smartest guys, but he wanted men who were able to stand up to the adversity of, of the fighting and, and uh, when things got bad, wouldn't lose their nerve. So he, he defined character a, a little bit differently as the war went on. Uh, second thing he looked for is he looked for um, uh, age. Marshall's World War I experiences convinced him that uh, Combat command was something for younger men, uh, guys in their 50s and even 40s if necessary. So throughout the war, he's always trying to push uh, his commanders to get younger men, get younger guys out leading the divisions and corps. And he complained that he wasn't sufficiently successful. It's always a, a work in progress as far as he was concerned. He also cared about education. Um, he believed that a good officer would be an educated officer, and he made uh, a point to check the officers' records to see whether they'd been to the Army War College Command and Staff School. Uh, so those are the big three. Might be one more, but I forget what it is. But it's also interesting to note there are certain things he didn't care about that much. You know, he didn't care if an officer hadn't fought in World War I and didn't have combat experience. That didn't matter much to him, which is kind of surprising. Uh, he didn't care about an officer's background, you know, where they came from geographically, where they came from in socioeconomic status, uh, all he's concerned about or how they were commissioned. You know, a number of guys became Corps and Army commanders who started out as enlisted men. He didn't care about that. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. You didn't care about the. Yeah, I guess those are the two big ones that I can think off the top of my head. But you'd think he would care about some of this stuff, but he didn't. I think later in the war, as as the war went on, and and there was a uh, you know more experienced. Uh, men around, uh, combat commanders around, didn't he always want to find those that had already proven themselves in combat? Yes, yeah, sometimes, but not always. Eisenhower seemed to be more interested in combat experience than Marshall did, because even late in the war, the guy who became the commander of the 10th Army, a guy named Simon Buckner, this is in late 44, he was put in charge of the 10th Army, and by that point, there were plenty of Corps commanders out there who had combat experience, and Buckner didn't, but Marshall still gave him command of the 10th Army for the Okinawa campaign. Yeah, okay, okay. So that brings us to the two theater commanders, and, and let me show a picture of these guys, and everybody will know who we're talking about. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, and um, here we go, and Dwight Eisenhower. This is a picture, I think, of them after the war. Uh, I was looking for something where I could have one picture with both. And during the war, they were never together. Interesting enough, they spent a lot of time together before the war with Eisenhower as uh, MacArthur's uh, right-hand man in the Philippines, right? For, I think, a long time, five years, six years, something like that. I think Eisenhower said everything he learned about acting came from working with uh, MacArthur. <laughs> So uh, uh, I can tell you this, uh, I'll give you a little preview of, of our uh, feedback from our members. Uh, only one or two mentioned MacArthur and even then sort of in the bottom part of their five, um, everybody had Eisenhower. Oh, that's interesting. Everybody had Eisenhower. Uh, my intent was not to include these two theater commanders, but just to go with the, the next level guys. So uh, in your book, uh, uh, I, there's, a, there's a, just one sentence I'm gonna read that I just found fascinating because it's so uh, analogous to the uh, corporate world, where it be it large corporate or, or small private companies. And this is Eisen, a quote that you gave of Eisenhower's. It's on page 11 of your book. And he's talking about the various military units and, and uh, army groups, field armies and corps uh, commanders. He says, Eisenhower says, I have developed an almost obsession as to the certainty with which you can judge a division or any other large unit merely by knowing its commander intimately. And then he goes on to say, you know, that the, that unit becomes a reflection of its commander. Right. And I, I, so true of all so many others, probably true of universities and academic groupings and certainly true in the corporate world. Right. So what did uh, Marshall see in Eisenhower that he promoted Eisenhower so quickly and so much over the top of so many other generals early in the war? Well, there's this uh, myth that Marshall had this little black book where he kept track of uh, generals he thought were promising. It turns out there really wasn't the black book. But Marshall didn't actually meet Eisenhower until relatively late in the, I think it's in the 1930s that they first came in contact, but he'd heard really good things about Eisenhower from lots of people. Right. And when the war began, there's a story that I think it's uh, Mark Clark. Um, Marshall said to Mark Clark, well, who do you think we should bring in? I think it's the work in, in the uh, War Department for, for, for Marshall. And Clark said something to the effect of, I'll give you a list of 10 names. I'll all say Eisenhower. And he brought Eisenhower to work directly under him uh, just to see what he was like. And Marshall was impressed with Eisenhower. Um, and Eisenhower was his chief planner, I believe. And then he sent Eisenhower to England to do some work there. And he impressed people there, including Winston Churchill. So when the time came to name a commander for Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, um, people said Eisenhower is probably the best one for the job. And Marshall agreed with that. And that's how Eisenhower got his start. And then, of course, served as Supreme Commander in uh, the Mediterranean, then in Northwest Europe. Talk about the right man with the right mentality, at the right time, in the right place, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's funny about Eisenhower. Eisenhower never commanded a division. He didn't command a corps. He didn't command a field army. 
but he just Canada. happened to be, as you said, in the right place at the right time to get that high level job and held on to it for the rest of the European war. Well, but I'm particularly referring to him being a um, commander of an allied army, right? That there may have been, I can't imagine that there were many other American senior generals that could have had the patience to put up with Montgomery and and a few others like him. Yeah, um, that's a that's a really good point. Um, back in the starting in the eighties, a lot of historians said that Eisenhower was overrated because he didn't have a lot of combat experience. They criticized his strategic decisions, but as you sort of allude to, you got to keep in mind of what kind of general Eisenhower was. He really wasn't a combat commander. He's more of a military manager. And being a military manager requires doing things like getting along with your allies. And Eisenhower is a guy who could do that. Everybody liked Eisenhower, except maybe Montgomery, but everybody liked Eisenhower. And that's the, that's the key to his success is that he's so likable and everybody's willing to defer to him for that reason. And then, of course, there's MacArthur who's almost like the other side of the coin in terms of personality and characteristics, yet incredibly effective at the end of the day, right? I mean, uh, uh, what was the relationship like between Marshall and MacArthur? Because after, after all, MacArthur was senior to Marshall in terms of uh, tenure, right? Yeah, uh, Marshall was a smart guy and he knew what he was dealing with, eyes, with, uh, with MacArthur. And throughout the war, Marshall was always really careful with MacArthur. He made sure he looked over every radio message that went to MacArthur's headquarters. He was always as deferential as he could be with uh, MacArthur. Uh, he sympathized with many of MacArthur's strategic ideas, but he knew that MacArthur was a prima donna. Uh, he knew that MacArthur had a tendency to get involved in politics. He knew that MacArthur was a vainglorious type of guy, though he was careful with them. The one time they met during the war, uh, they met in, I think it's 1943 at a, a, in a, an island off of New Guinea. And they were both very nice on their best behavior. They called each other by their first names, but, but Marshall was always careful in his dealings with MacArthur. And he tended to give MacArthur a little more leeway than he did say Eisenhower, by which I mean the relationship is more formal. It's not as intimate as the relationship Marshall had with Eisenhower. Right, right, right. You know, it just, in my mind, continues to uh, boost the stock, the opinion of the intelligence of Marshall, because, you know, it's like having yin and yang as your two direct reports, you know, and how you could get along with two such different men. Uh, underlies a lot of, uh, points to a lot of intelligence on Marshall's part. Yeah, he was a smart guy. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let's get into a little bit of, uh, and, and we got, I, want, I don't wanna get too far in the weeds with everybody, but you have to uh, uh, understand the structure of the U.S. Army ground forces in World War II, right? To, to appreciate the, how these 38 men, right? So the highest level structure in the U.S. Army in World War II was the U.S. Army Group. And there were really only two, both were in Europe. The 12th Army Group, which Omar Bradley comes to command, and the 6th Army Group, which Jacob Devers uh, comes to command. No army group ever operated in the Pacific because we, we didn't get to invade Japan. Had we invaded Japan, I guess there would have been an army group commanded probably by MacArthur himself. <laughs> yeah. Because he would have had anybody underneath him in that position. Yeah, there was an army group in Italy that was a, more of an inter-allied one that Clark commanded for a bit toward the end ah, of the war. Okay, okay, okay. So... Um, uh, talk about Bradley and Devers for us, please. Everybody knows Bradley, without a doubt. I'm guessing one out of five, one out of ten people could, could tell you about Jacob Devers. Though. Well, Bradley, of course, was a uh, Eisenhower and a Marshall protege. Um, he led the 12th Army Group before then. He'd been a field army commander and a corps commander. And Reading over the generals from World War II, almost everybody liked Bradley. They not only liked him, they respected him because he did such a good job leading them. He was very supportive 
I, he didn't backstab. Um, he treated the, his, the subordinates very respectfully. And they said he was a great tactician and he knew, you know, there's a reason why he was called the GI's, G, GI's commander because he understood every, every uh, layer of the command structure. Uh, and because he was supported by Marshall and Eisenhower and he played such an important role in defeating Germany, it's Bradley and Bradley's protégés that ended up dominating the army in the post-war years, which is another reason why everybody remembers him. Now, yeah. Jacob Devers, Devers commanded the 6th Army Group. He had been, he was sort of a Marshall protégé, but he got into trouble because he and Eisenhower got crossways. Um, Eisenhower never respected Devers. He called him a lightweight. Um, Patton agreed with that, only Patton said it's kind of like the pot calling the kettle black, uh, but Patton did, denigrated everybody in his diary. Um, but that Devers, he was a successful general. He's a guy with a lot of common sense, uh, unlike Bradley, who had plenty of resources. Devers had to make do with very little. Uh, he was able to maneuver himself into an army group command. He led a American and a French army in the southern part of the Western Front in World War II. And he was very successful. He was able to find himself some really good uh, corps commanders and field army commanders. And he doesn't have, he's not as well known. And he doesn't have such a good reputation because Eisenhower and Bradley didn't like him. But there have been a couple biographies out in the last few years that have started to rehabilitate the guy and said he deserves a lot more credit than, than historians have up till now given, given him. But because the army after World War II was dominated by Bradley and his guys, he just sank into obscurity. You know, in my own reading uh, of Eisenhower, uh, when when you get to the part in the book about Eisenhower uh, about his relationship with Jacob De with Jacob Devers, it makes my skin crawl a little bit because I you know we have this the myth of Eisenhower that you know you know he was always a hundred percent with high integrity and 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 so forth, but his um, uh, treatment of Jacob Devers led a, left a lot to be desired, I think. It's yeah, you get the impression that when so, Eisenhower and Bradley and Patton would sit around, they'd spend their time making fun of Devers. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I think I said to you <laughs> last time, I had I had to find somebody to tell me how to pronounce Devers' last name when I started doing the research. I didn't know whether it was Devers or Devers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So let's stop there. So, so we've defined the very top military brass of the U.S. Army ground forces, Marshall, Eisenhower, MacArthur, and these, these Army group commanders. So Todd, are, are anybody got any questions posted in the chat room? Does anybody want to uh, uh, ask any questions at this point before we, we go? Have a, we have a lot of chat here in the chat room, and I was just going to answer uh, John Euler had a question. Is Joseph McNarney discussed in the book? I don't think he is, right, Steve? Not much. Uh, McNarney worked closely with Marshall in Washington, and then towards the end of the war, he became the, I think he was assistant theater commander in the Mediterranean. And um, the British liked him. Uh, at one point during the fighting in the Battle of the Bulge, McNarney donated his allotment of replaces, replacements to Eisenhower to fill the uh, depleted ranks in Northwest Europe. So Eisenhower is always grateful to him for that. But no, I didn't spend a lot of time with him because he wasn't a combat commander. He wasn't a combat commander. Lisa Refner said she's listening to your book on Audible right now. Oh, great. Are, are you the narrator or do you know? I know they found somebody to narrate it. I don't know who it was. Okay. Nick All right. Anderson is his last name. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Anderson is his last name. And he's good. He's good. It's I, something I've determined is certain books I like to listen to better than read. I get more out of them. And this is another one where when you're really talking about the inner relationships, it's easier for me to follow by listening to somebody reading it than me trying to do it myself. It's James right. Anderson Foster is the reader. James, you should know that, James. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Trey, we have Trey joining us from Annapolis, Maryland. Trey is uh, 14 years old. Hello. How are you, Trey? How are you doing? Good. Um, tired, but I decided to come. Good. I, I appreciate it. On a school night. Yep. Um, 
one first thing I want to say, you have to write a book about the five star admirals in the Navy and just the admiral. <laughs> never. He will it, never write about the Navy. A hundred percent. No, he's not going to write about the Navy. Yeah, I thought about Do doing it. that and I started breaking down the command structure. And it's a lot more complicated than the army. <laughs> it is. I, I read like a book keeping about things it. it's simple. So dr- it's just it's a cat fight everywhere. Yeah. He's gonna he's gonna leave that uh, mission for you, Trey. Yeah, somebody else could do it. <laughs> Trey, Trey you need to go. You need to go to Stephen Austin University and become a research fellow there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna join the Navy. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I wanted to ask a question again. Mr. DePastina is going to probably know what's going to come out of my mouth. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to do anything with the Navy. It's, it's, it's grand. So Patton is known as one of the larger, more strategic commanders that figured out the, um, the fact that the tank is one of the key parts of the modern battlefield, the way combined arms works. Um, And in North Africa, we had M10 tank destroyers and M3 Stuart-like tanks. We didn't have Shermans yet um, in the early North African campaign in the first armored division. What, what was, what was the, the other generals, what did they think of the armored vehicles and how do they think it went? Because doctrine was very, very strange in the U S army for them seeing as we thought of tanks, not as something to kill another tank, but as infantry support vehicles and then we would build a completely separate anti-tank vehicle to send in there like a tank destroyer. But instead of what most countries would do where we need a tank destroyer because it's way cheaper to make than a regular tank, they built it to specifically kill tanks, um, stuff like the M10, the M18 Hellcat, um, stuff like the Sherman, Stuart. They were all meant for infantry support, the Lee, but the only real tank came at the very end of the war with the Patton. Uh, which was the first tank to tank U.S. tank. So, what what did the what do you think the other generals thought of the armored vehicle? Um, well, so. When it comes to the specifics of tanks, I'll defer to you since you obviously know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, it depends on the general. Some of those guys uh, were patent proteges and they bought into the patent ethos about the tank, but others of them they tended to see tanks more as supporters for infantrymen. And, and the guy like Courtney Hodges, who was the first army commander, um, he tended to see tanks as just something to support the infantry, not as something that should operate on their own. Not to say he didn't do it but it's not at times, but his attitude is more that tanks support the infantry. Uh, so it just depends on the general um, and what they had done before the war because as you point out there are those two schools of thought before the war about either keeping tanks together and sending them off in the wild blue like cavalry or whether you use them to back up the infantry so the easiest answer i can give you just depends on which kind of which which general we're talking about and it was a a cultural phenomenon in the u.s army before the war that the tanks were strictly to be um you know in support of the infantry and, and it was only with the success of the uh, German, uh, uh, you know, uh, Panzer divisions in 1940 that some U.S. Army commanders, Patton among them, began to see it differently. But it, it took a lot of time and effort to change uh, uh, the mentality. Yeah, yeah, it actually, took mostly as Blitzkrieg in the Western Front. Right. Right. That's actually where a lot of the myths of German tank superiority came from over the Sherman and stuff, how they were undergunned. They weren't undergunned for the role they were performing. A 75 millimeter cannon's more than enough to take out infantry, but they weren't meant to take out tanks because the U.S. didn't want them to take out tanks. We had stuff like the 76 on the M10. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Connor Ritchie from Lafayette, Louisiana, 16 years old. How are you doing, Connor? Very well. How are you? Good. Yes. So this is a very interesting topic Topic to talk about. Uh, as you know, I've up to 24 World War II veteran interviews, and um, I've heard generals like uh, Eisenhower and Patch and all these other generals. Uh, one of them in particular, his battalion, uh, helped the 63rd Division, which was part of Patch's uh, 7th Army. I was wondering if you would speak about General Patch a little bit, about Patch's career. Talk about what kind of general he was. 
Yeah, Patches, he commanded the 7th Army. Uh, he got his start out in the Pacific. He's one of the few guys who fought against both the Japanese and against the Germans. He started out as a, a division commander, uh, commanded the Americal Division, which was formed out in the Pacific. And then he commanded the 14th Corps, and he led the 14th Corps in the latter stages of the Guadalcanal campaign. And then he got sick. Uh, so he was relieved and sent back to the States. And um, he got in some trouble before he was sent back because he revealed, uh, not completely, but he hinted that the Allies had been able to kill uh, Yamamoto, the Japanese naval commander, by breaking Japanese codes. And that got him in all sorts of trouble with Marshall and King, uh, the commander of the Navy. And for a while, Marshall thought about just sidelining him completely from the war effort. And Patch, had no, Patch knew he screwed up and felt really bad about it. The only reason why Patch found himself with an active role in Europe is because Devers was looking for somebody to command the invasion of southern France. And he wanted somebody with some amphibious experience and some combat experience. But most of those guys, Eisenhower was snagging. And Devers, who was, did a good job of making something out of nothing, he was looking around for somebody who fit his criteria. And somebody mentioned that, that Patch was coming over. And he said something to the effect of, that's the very man I want. So Patch became the commander of the 7th Army, and he served under Devers for the rest of the war. And Devers had nothing but good things to say about Patch. In fact, even Patton had nice things to say about Patch. And Patton hated almost all his uh, rivals and, and particularly when he writes in his diary. Uh, so Devers, I think, is one of the more underrated guys. He fought very aggressively in southern France. Uh, he handled his troops well. You can make an argument that if Eisenhower had been paying attention to what was going on in Patch's 7th Army and Devers' 6th Army group, he would have had the opportunity to cross the Rhine in late 44 and maybe have ended the war a little bit earlier. So Devers, I'm sorry, uh, Patch was a, a solid, good general. Eisenhower later rated him a little bit lower than some of the other field army commanders, but Eisenhower wasn't exactly the most objective guy. But Devers certainly thought the world of him. Uh, so, so again, one of those underrated guys in the American army. In, in fact, why don't we just segue that into the next discussion of the army commanders, since we're kind of already there, okay? Uh, let me uh, show you again here uh, uh, so a couple of pictures. So. Army groups, then army, then armies, right? There were eight U.S. armies in World War II, five in the um, Europe and three in the Pacific, right? Right. Um, and I just mentioned here a couple of these, some of the obvious names, first, third, and ninth U.S. armies, Bradley and Hodges, right? Bradley commanded the first U.S. army before he became an army group commander. Patton, who everybody knows. Simpson, who not too many people know about. And also a little bit like Patch, uh, underrated, not as uh, much uh, publicity thrown his way. And then in the Pacific, and this I always find interesting, um, I, you know, these, a lot of these are forgotten names, especially the first three, Kruger, Eichelberger, Buckner. Uh, and then, of course, Stilwell, just at the very tail end after he leaves China, takes over uh, the 10th Army from Buckner when uh, uh, Buckner is killed in, in, in Okinawa, right? Um, so uh, a couple of photos here. Um, Patton, of course, everybody knows Patton. Patton was on most of the list, but not all of the lists that came in. And then this is one of my favorite guys who didn't make anybody's list. And that's Simpson, commander of the Ninth Army. Speak a little bit about Simpson and some of the other Army commanders, and then let's take some questions about Army, other Army commanders. Uh, Simpson was a well-respected officer. As you can see, he was bald. In fact, when Patton introduced him to Patton staff officers, Patton said he was a, a spokesman for some hair tonic. <laughs> uh, but, but he's a well-respected guy. He didn't get over to Europe until a little bit later after the um, invasion of, of Northwest Europe. And at first, Eisenhower wasn't going to give him a field army because Simpson didn't have any combat experience. But Marshall thought he was a capable guy. And Marshall was able to, and um, McNair were able to persuade Eisenhower to give Simpson a chance. And Simpson fought with the Ninth Army for the rest of the war. And 
even Bradley said at one point that working with Simpson was incredibly refreshing because he wasn't the prima donna like like Patton was with the third army. He wasn't sour and pessimistic like Hodges was with the first army. It was a very can do staff that got the job done. So so he he's one of the, like Patch. He's another one of those underrated American generals. Now, in the Pacific, the uh, Sixth Army commander, a guy named Walter Kruger. Kruger's interesting because he was born in Germany and he enlisted in the army during the Spanish-American War as an enlisted man. And then later on, he became a uh, officer and he was a friend of MacArthur's. And um, after the first American victory in the Pacific for the army at Buna and Gona, uh, the 8th Army commander, Eichelberger, got a lot of credit for winning that battle for MacArthur. In fact, Eichelberger got put on the covers of Time and um, Life magazine, and that really bothered MacArthur because he didn't like anybody horning in on his limelight. So he brought in this Kruger guy to command what became the 6th Army and sidelined the Eichelberger guy for a while. And he brought in Kruger because he knew Kruger. In fact, he had to persuade Marshall to send him over because Kruger was a little bit too old for Marshall's tastes. And Kruger uh, was a very no-nonsense, unpleasant guy in many respects, but he knew what he was doing and he had a really tough job because he didn't have a lot of resources. He had to coordinate his activities with the Navy and a series of amphibious assaults. He had to work with MacArthur. He called MacArthur the needle from behind because MacArthur is always pushing him to keep moving. Uh, and by the end of the war, and one of the reasons why I don't think Kruger gets as much credit as, as perhaps he deserves, most of his subordinate generals just didn't like him because Kruger was so overbearing and humorless and just a disagreeable man. But he had some of the hardest assignments of the war, and he fulfilled those assignments. Even MacArthur said at one point that um, Kruger was a great general. I don't know how he behaved if he was in defeat because he was never defeated. Uh, but, but the thing that MacArthur liked the most about Kruger is Kruger kept out of his limelight. Uh, the other Pacific War Army general, field army commander who fought with MacArthur was that Eichelberger guy. And Eichelberger was a very popular, genial fellow, very capable guy. Uh, and he went over into to Australia early in the war. And again, he won one of the first battles of the war for MacArthur at Boonagona. But that made MacArthur jealous. So MacArthur sidelined him, sent him to Australia to train soldiers for all of 1943. And Eichelberger got real depressed. He wanted to leave because he didn't think he was being used properly. And in fact, Marshall tried to pry Eichelberger loose from the Pacific to go command a field army in Northwest Europe at D-Day. But MacArthur recognized Eichelberger's abilities and kept him there. And eventually he rehabilitated Eichelberger, gave him a corps, then he became an army commander. And he fought in the uh, Philippines and tactically, he was a very good general. Uh, he seized the Philippines in a series of brilliant amphibious assaults, Southern Philippines, I should say. So uh, everybody liked working for Eichelberger. They hated working for Kruger because he was so unpleasant, but they all liked working for Eichelberger. And you read Eichelberger's diary and it's usually whenever generals get together, they spend all their time complaining about Kruger and wishing they were serving with Eichelberger. And then the last one there is a guy named Buckner. He commanded the 10th Army in the Central Pacific, and his one campaign was in Okinawa. And Buckner, as I said earlier, he, um, he got command of a field army, even though he didn't have much, com he didn't have any combat experience, but Marshall really respected him, thought he deserved a chance at, at combat command after doing a series of training assignments in the States. Uh, He's the one that tactically was probably the least capable of all the field army commanders. At Okinawa, he often resorted to frontal assaults on Japanese positions when a more creative approach might have reduced American casualties. Although in his defense, it was his first campaign. And he was killed towards the end of the campaign, right as it was coming to a close. And that's why Stilwell went over. Stilwell, uh, Marshall sent him over to command the 10th Army, and he led it for just a couple, he's not even a week or so before the fighting in Okinawa ended. Okay. Okay. So let's pause again, uh, Todd, and uh, uh, other any questions about other army commanders or these themselves? We didn't talk about Patton only because we all know about Patton. I mean, there's <laughs> what more is there to say about George Patton? 
I right. saw the movie. <laughs> yes. Which which uh, Greg Yost has pointed out is playing at 8 p.m. Eastern on Turner Classic Movies tonight. <laughs> it so happens to be. Um, and it is so uh, was, there's a there's a word there's it's so disappointing that MacArthur lives down to his reputation every time. I mean, that just seems to be such a failure of leadership um, to be so threatened by competence adjacent to you uh, that you have to send competent people away. But I guess that's that must be common at high levels. Probably MacArthur, MacArthur's favorite, uh, I don't know if he was a general, but officer, I, I can't remember his name right now, it just won't come to mind, was his press officer, <laughs> right? Who stayed with him through the occupation of Japan and into the Korean War as well. And I think that's when he might have become you know, a general at that time. I think that's um, Whitney. Whitney, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rick Erisman has a good question, and it's not related to the generals, but it has to do, and it's the same question I had. What's that? What is that behind you over your right shoulder? Uh, we're we're kind of looking at those items, and wondering what they are. My wife, uh, her best friend in graduate school was a Yemeni woman. And so my wife in 1998, she got on a plane and she flew to Yemen to see this woman. And uh, she gave her this Yemeni ceremonial knife to give to me. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. That is a funky looking knife. Very yeah. good. All right. Rick will be happy to, to get that answer. Um, I, Derek Sansone, he's a, he's a Navy CB veteran. He's disappointed that you're not going to do the equivalent of Lincoln and his admirals for World War II. Um, I, you know, Derek, you asked a question. Derek, why don't you unmute yourself and ask the question you just posted in, uh, in the chat? Uh, good evening, Steve. Hi. Um, I have an unread book on my shelf about Joseph Stilwell and his experiences in China. I believe his nickname was Vinegar Joe. I don't know a lot about him. I'm looking forward to reading the book, but can you uh, say a few more words about him? Stillwell's a sad case. Stillwell was a up and comer in the American army. Ordinarily, he should have ended up being a field army commander fighting with Eisenhower in Europe. Uh, but he ended up being sent to China to serve as uh, our advisor to Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang. And the reason why he got that job is because he spoke Chinese fluently. Uh, he, he'd been to China several times and it looked on paper like he'd be perfect for this job in China. But he was completely wrong for it because he didn't have the personality. The job he got sent to China to do was mostly a diplomatic job, really. And he was not a diplomat. Again, his nickname was Vinegar Joe. That tells you all about him. So he had a very frustrating time in China trying to get everybody to focus on the Japanese when the Chinese were more interested in focusing on each other and destroying each other. And getting the British on board to help was another problem he had. So it, it's really a, a case of a missed opportunity to take this talented guy and put him in a combat command and he ends up in a diplomatic post mostly that was completely ill-suited for it. My favorite story about Stilwell is he'd go to India to try to persuade the British to take a more active role in the war, in the war over there. And uh, people would complain that when they played God Save the King, Stilwell wouldn't even stand up. You know, I, I have to say, uh, and, and Steve and I talked about this in one of our conversations, uh, I just finished that book. Uh, and who's that? Uh, Derek? Derek. Is that, is Derek Sansone. Just finished that book by Barbara Tuckman. What, what a wonderful writer to begin with, right? Um, and I, I, as well, did not have a high opinion about Stilwell until I read that book. You know, he was sent on Mission Impossible, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, like trying to change you know, Mecca into, you know, a Christian holy site, you know, just not going to happen, right? Um, but what you appreciate about him is two or three things. Um, uh, one, uh, incredible heroism in defeat, getting kicked out of Burma, and the way he led the remnants of, of the Chinese and other troops there out of Burma, but then turns around and fights for logistics for a year, 
to return to take Burma. It was all about opening up the Burma Road and the hump and all that, right? And, and he does it uh, against incredible odds with virtually no resources, with basically, you know, 10 Boy Scout troops as, as his army, you know, uh, and he does it, you know. And minimal so, support from the British and Chinese governments. And, and, and the other part that you'll appreciate is that uh, how China was viewed at, uh, strategically by the U.S. in the first few years of the war and why Roosevelt wanted to keep them in uh, the game. Because originally the thought was, we may not make it across the Pacific. Let's come through China and uh, uh, bomb and invade China, perhaps, from or, or Japan from the Chinese coast. Um, but I, I finished that book uh, actually wanting to read more about Stillwell. And of course, tragically, he dies in 1946 of stomach cancer. Yeah. And, and, and the last thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll stop my eulogy on, on Stillwell, <laughs> is he would have been, he was rated the top corps commander in the U.S. Army in um, uh, early 1942 and was slated to lead the invasion of North Africa uh, you know, had he stuck around and instead gone to China. So. And he would have been much happier doing that. Yes, yes. Right. You know, Steve, uh, the guy I studied, uh, Bill Malden, the World War II cartoonist, he didn't, there are a lot of generals he didn't like, uh, <laughs> but, but one he worshipped, uh, truly, especially toward the end of his life, I mean, he talked a lot about him, was Lucian Truscott. Um, what did Marshall think of Truscott and, you know, what was his assessment? Yeah, Truscott was um, commander of the sixth. Well, he started out commanding the third division, which is one of the famous divisions from World War II. Then he became the commander of the sixth corps. And towards the end of the war, he rose to field army command towards the very end as the fifth army commander. Uh, Marshall liked him. Everybody respected him from the get go, uh, except Patton, of course. Patton had some doubts about him. Uh, but even Patton said kinder things about Truscott than he did other people. I'd say, and most people would probably agree, that Truscott was probably one of the two or three most effective corps commanders of World War II. He fought in Italy and one of the few American generals whose reputation survived fighting in Italy. Then he fought in southern France and he went back to Italy. Uh, the thing that impressed me the most is Truscott put a lot of thought into the war from the average soldier's perspective, which is probably why Modern liked them. Uh, Truscott believed that every soldier should have one hour a day just to himself one hour a day just to write letters or take a nap or whatever, which shows a certain thoughtfulness for the average soldier. But at one point, Truscott had gone back to the States and Marshall invited him to his office to watch the daily briefing that Marshall got. And um, they were talking about Italy and Marshall said to Truscott, well, would you be interested in going back to Italy? And Truscott said, I'll go wherever you send me. And Marshall said, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, what do you want? Do you want to go back to Italy? And um, Truscott said, I'll, I'll do what you want. So they ended up sending him back to Italy, even though Truscott would have rather stayed a corps commander under Bradley, under De Devers, I'm sorry, than go back to Italy and serve under Mark Clark. In fact, cut to the point where Truscott was willing to take a reduction in rank to stay a corps commander under Devers than to go back to Italy and serve with Mark Clark again. But he ended up back in Italy anyway, uh, and ended up again towards the end of the war being a field army commander. And one of the best American combat commanders of the war. Was Mark Clark the uh, Mediterranean equivalent of MacArthur? Um, in terms of personality, he might not have been as mystical as MacArthur was, but he certainly believed that some force wanted him to play a major role in the war. Very vain guy. It's funny, we, we actually didn't even discuss him when we were discussing uh, army, uh, our, uh, army commanders. And uh, again, a difficult man, very difficult man. And I read of, I've read of no senior general underneath him who enjoyed working underneath him, right? Well, Clark had his good points. He was aggressive. Um, he supported his subordinates and that he tried to make sure they had everything that they needed. He ran a great staff, but he was vain. He did deny his subordinates the credit they deserved. The most famous example of his vanity, of course, was he diverted, diverted soldiers to going after Rome when he had a chance of destroying an entire German army in early 1944. So you're right. Most of those guys didn't like working for him. Truscott didn't like working for him. 
and Truscott, let's not forget, was the uh, general who kind of saved the situation at uh, Anzio. Right. Brought in to replace Lucas, who we're going to talk about in a minute. Right. You know, um, I would just want to butt in. Dom Nemchek said two kind things here. First, he said when he grows up, this is a, a Vietnam veteran. When he grows up, he wants to be like uh, Connor and Henry and Trey, our teenagers who are who join us. And then also he had nothing but praise, Glenn, for your abilities as a Zoom host. Oh, thank he you. He loves thank your you, relaxed God. style. And just kind of following in the in the you know spirit of MacArthur, I'm going to fire you because of that. You're well, going to have to sit on the bench for a few weeks, okay? <laughs> well, I, I find I find a sh, you know a little bit of uh, whiskey during the presentation keeps me calm, you know, okay. just like some of the other generals. <laughs> this segues into Army Corps commanders since uh, Todd brought up uh, Truscott. So 20 U.S. Army Corps commanders during the war, 15 in the York, five in the Pacific. Some of the most na famous names besides uh, uh, Truscott were uh, uh, Lawton Collins, uh, Ridgeway, who we have a connection with here in Pittsburgh, in Europe. Um, uh, uh, of course, Corps commanders in the Pacific were, were also Eichelberger and, and Kruger before they moved up to uh, Field Army. Right? Uh, not Kruger. Kruger was never a Corps commander. Never. Oh, my, my mistake. My mistake. There, now you have grounds to fire me. <laughs> And here's Matthew Ridgway. Uh, talk a little bit about Matthew Ridgway for us. Well, Ridgway started out as, a, as an airborne division commander. He commanded the 82nd Airborne. And before the, before the war, he was so, before the United States was actively involved in the war, I should say, he was so committed to getting a combat command that he spent all his time hanging outside of Marshall's office. It was just so Marshall would see him and hopefully send him to a combat position. And it got to the point where Marshall had his secretary tell Ridgway, go away when I've got something for you, I'll let you know. And he got command of the 82nd Airborne. And when it became an airborne division, that sort of catapulted Ridgway into a prominent position in the war because the 82nd was an airborne division and not a regular run of the mill division. And he led the 82nd through Sicily and then Italy. And then, of course, a D-Day. And um, eventually he became the commander of the 18th Airborne Corps. He fought at a market garden. He didn't really have it. It was a British run show, so he didn't have as much authority as he should have. But in World War II, his uh, best days were at the Battle of the Bulge when he commanded not just the Airborne forces, but uh, uh, other forces on the northern shoulder of the Ardennes and did a great job in stopping the Germans there. And that solidified his reputation as, as one of the best corps commanders of the war. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the other thing about Ridgeway, you got to mention, although outside of our purview tonight, is his uh, capabilities come to uh, 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 bear and are illustrated dramatically in the Korean War, mm -hmm. where he takes over from, uh, I can't forget, the general who died, I can't remember. Walker. Yeah, Walker. And uh, turns the whole situation around. An irony of all ironies, he does it under MacArthur, MacArthur and suffers some of MacArthur's uh, vainglorious attitude as well. Yeah, I wrote a book on that. I did a whole book on <laughs> MacArthur and the Korean War. Yeah, okay. And now I, I wanted to mention this man also, I think name lost to history, but unique because he was the only U.S. National Guard general to rise to corps level, General Raymond McLean, right? Yes. Uh, speak, speak to him a, a, about him a bit for us. Yeah. How, did he, how did he get into such a uh, high-level position as the only National Guard general? Well, McLean was a uh, banker, and he was part of the, I think it's that Oklahoma explains it. National Guard. Now, now I understand. Now I understand. It. If it's a banker, <laughs> he must have been a really bright, charismatic guy. Yeah, but uh, he was part of the Oklahoma National Guard, and because he was a banker, he had the flexibility that he's able to attend some of these high-level Army schools. So he had the education that guys like Marshall looked for. And when World War II began, he started out as the artillery commander in, I think, the 45th Division, but I'm not sure. And then uh, when the Allies invaded Northwest Europe, he found himself leading the 90th Division. The 90th Division 
was the problem child of Normandy. It was a division that it got so bad, they thought of dismembering the division. And McLean got the job of putting it together. Uh, and he did a really good job. He made the 90th Division one of the best divisions in the American Army. So he was able to take it from being one of the worst to one of the best divisions. And that put him on Marshall's radar. So when a Corps command came open for, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's the 19th Corps, um, I think it's Patton. Patton said he wanted McLean. And at first, some people said, well, maybe that might not be the best idea because he's, he's not a professional soldier. And McCart and a Patton finally said, look, it's my army. Shouldn't I be able to pick the guy I want to command one of my corps? And that was good enough. So he became the commander of the 19th Corps. Eventually, he ended up in the 9th Army with Simpson. And uh, Simpson rated him as, as a great corps commander. And um, everybody I've read agreed on that. After the war, I think he became comptroller of the army after the war. Hmm. Stayed in the army. Interesting. Okay. So, so any comments on other corps commanders uh, from the audience? Uh, Lawton Collins is one of my favorite, and I think one of the two or three most highly rated corps commanders uh, during the war. Yeah. Uh, also came from the Pacific, Guadalcanal, and, and moved over to the European theater, like Patch. Todd, anybody? Uh, I'm gonna, any yeah, I, I'll bring in uh, Connor Ritchie again from Louisiana. Connor, I should let you know, Steve, Connor has on his own, he's 16 years old. He has made it a, a practice of calling World War II veterans and really getting to know them, having long conversations with them. And he's interviewed 24 World War II veterans. He keeps a notebook on them and their experiences. And I was going to have to ask him, let's see, I believe Connor is still with us. Connor, um, I know that he's had uh, several of the veterans who he's talked with express admiration for particular generals. Connor, what names come up um, um, with the veterans that you've talked with? Uh, Harry Miller. Harry Miller is one. Uh, I've spoken several hours with him. Last time I spoke to him, he was talking about uh, uh, Walker and Ridgeway. And he said that Walker uh, was very associated with Patton because he was a little guy, a little fat guy that was involved in General Patton's 20th Corps. And Walker was killed in Korea and Ridgeway took over Walker's place. And he had a lot of respect for Ridgeway. He remembers the time that he saw General Ridgeway uh, raise a cane on those engineers by building the bridge in the Ruhr River after it was uh, flooded and told him to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, and all that. And he also had a lot of respect for Gavin as well, which was the next commander after Ridgeway. Okay, Gavin. And and that is that is a name that has come up, Glenn, hasn't it, uh, Gavin, in yeah, some of yeah. our rankings? Yeah, yeah, Gavin's name is mentioned many times, but Gavin never rose above divisional command. Right. Okay. So there, there are 89 U.S. Army divisions in World War II, 27 in the Pacific, 62, if I got that right, in Europe. Um, uh, but that's not included in Steve's book. Uh, we're just looking at the high command, if you will. Okay. So Gavin, very young. I think he was the youngest divisional general in World War II. Do, do you know that, he, Steve? Uh, he was 37. That sounds about right, but I wouldn't bet money on it. I don't know for sure. Connor says he was 37. Oh, yeah. 37, yeah. You see pictures of him uh, from, from World War II. And, you know, he very he, besides being 37, he had a very, uh, you know, baby face, young looking man. You know, looked like he might have just stepped out of uh, uh, senior year of college. <laughs> so, you know, I, I do have another question, a follow up question, Steve, if you want to address it. I've read before that General Marshall had a very, during World War II, had a, had a respectful and distant relationship with the president, Franklin Roosevelt. And that was very much, uh, I get the sense that that was very much deliberate. Um, Roosevelt, you know, could charm the pants off of anybody, but he couldn't charm the pants off of Marshall. And Marshall, was that a defense or was that part of the civilian military divide that that uh, Marshall held sacred or, or what? Where did that come from? It's a little both, but mostly because Marshall understood how charming Roosevelt could be. And there are a couple of stories that illustrate this. At one point, uh, they're at a meeting in which Roosevelt called Marshall George. 
and Marshall took offense to this and didn't want. It. Oops. Up. Oh. Marshall became chief of staff and he met with Roosevelt. Marshall said to Roosevelt, you know, I'm going to have to tell you unpleasant things. Uh, and you just got to understand that I'm not going to be bringing you good news all the time. And he didn't socialize with Roosevelt. Uh, he avoided the White House dinner parties because he didn't want to have a personal relationship with Roosevelt. He thought it might cloud his judgment. Yeah. I, I wonder if that remained with Truman when Marshall moved to become secretary of state. I would imagine maybe that he wouldn't need that divide anymore. Uh, I don't know as much about it, but there was that formality there. They, they weren't social intimates either. So okay. that formality remained. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. My, my phone rang. My <laughs> forgot to turn the darn thing off. Any other questions out there? I think uh, Derek Sanson has a, a comment about a British general that he admired. I don't know if you've done much uh, research on the you know, British-American relations, Steve. Oh, Greg Yost has his hand up. Greg. Yes, definitely. I, I love this. I, you know, give me, give me about six, eight hours and I'll maybe get started here. But uh, no, uh, a few anecdotes. One is a question about Marshall. Is it um, given the unified command structures, I understand that with all the four stars running around that um, this is when the five star was created, which was the only U.S. equivalent to a European field marshal so that we didn't so that there could be that level of rank. And there's a sense in which the five star is still honorary Later, after the war, Omar Bradley only had four stars, but he was actually Douglas MacArthur, five stars commander. That's another story. But I understand that they wanted to call it Marshall because that's what the Europeans called it. And George Marshall didn't want to be known as Marshall. He was obviously going to become the first five star. So he didn't want to become known as Marshall Marshall. Is there any truth? Do you ever hear that one? I've heard the same story. I forget where I read it, but I, I've heard the same story, which knowing Marshall, I guess that probably makes sense. I've heard the same. I've read the same somewhere a couple of times. You know, he didn't like the alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. But it, 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 let me just uh, finish off and then we can get into deeper, more questions here. Just one last part of what we uh, sort of prepared for discussion. Um, uh, and this is sort of, you know, lest you think, uh, you know, everybody was a success story. Uh, it's always been fascinating to me. There were at least three. Maybe there was a fourth you told me about, Steve. Uh, uh, U.S. generals, all corps commanders dismissed in, 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 in action, while in action during World War II. Uh, this is Lloyd Friedenhall uh, 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 dismissed after Kasserine Pass. Uh, in North Africa. What's the story behind that, Steve? Yeah, Friedendahl, he was a Corps commander, commanded the Second Corps. He was um, Leslie McNair, the ground forces commander back in Washington, one of his favorites. And uh, Eisenhower picked him to lead one of the invasions of North Africa in Operation Torch. And then when he was at Kasserine Pass, the Germans beat up on the Second Corps, something awful. And um, Friedendahl, he just lost his nerve. He froze. He didn't really perform that well. So after the battle was over, Eisenhower removed him after a lot of angst. He removed him from his command and gave it to, to Patton. And Friedendahl ended up going back to the States and leading a field army in the United States. I think it was the second or fourth army. I forget which. And didn't play an active role in the war from that point. Yeah. To me, the story behind this, too, is... Uh, you know, this was a protege, as you said, of Leslie McNair and Marshall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Eisenhower really didn't know him. He was put in place by the higher ups. And I, I, I believe that, that Eisenhower uh, put up with more from Frieden, no, Frieden Hall, Frieden no, I'm sorry, Dahl, Dahl than, than, than he should have over time. But in respect to his higher ups who kind of put him in that place, he didn't uh, move quick enough, even after Kasserine. There's a great story about uh, General uh, Harmon, who's another great field commander, who went out to visit uh, Kasserine as the battle was unfolding just towards the end of it, and how he had to intercede to sort of save the day. 
All right. And even after that, Marshall uh, uh, or Eisenhower, I'm sorry, did not dismiss uh, 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 Friedenau. So yeah. it, it was a slower process than it should have been. Uh, yeah, but it's funny. Generals start out with that reluctance to relieve commanders, but the real good ones, they lose that hesitation as time goes on. And then the second one is General um, Dolly, I've forgotten his first name, um, uh, who's relieved at Salerno by Mark Clark. And uh, there's a story behind that as, as well. Uh, Steve? Yeah, Ernst Dolly, he commanded the Sixth Corps. Uh, he didn't have any combat experience. He was the commander at the invasion of Italy at Salerno in September of 1943. And people have defended the way he fought there. Things didn't go well, but the Americans and the British did win the battle. But it's after the battle was over that uh, one of the British generals, Alexander, said to, I think he said to Eisenhower, surely you have better men than this. Uh, and he was relieved of his command. Uh, because Clark felt it was either Dolly or Clark would have to take responsibility for the near defeat there. And when it came to Mark Clark, he wasn't going to take responsibility for anything bad that happened. So right. Dolly was relieved of his command. The other guy, Lucas, was also in the Fifth Army with Clark. So it's interesting that the two of the three big examples of Corps commanders getting relieved were both relieved by Mark Clark and both were controversial reliefs, particularly Lucas here, who was relieved at Anzio for not being aggressive enough when really, if he'd have been more aggressive, he probably would have lost his entire corps, but he did the right thing by hunkering down and building up a defensive position. But that's not what people like Churchill and others expected. So he became the scapegoat for bad decision making above him. So the accusation is that Clark didn't stand up for his guys. Well, yeah, that Clark's right, right. In fact, Clark had warned Lucas, had said before the invasion took place that don't stick your neck out. That's what got me in trouble at Salerno. But he was getting contradictory advice from others. His orders were to hunker down. He followed his orders, but that didn't accomplish what, what guys like Churchill thought an invasion of Anzio would accomplish, which was to get to Rome. Right, right. Which uh, almost certainly would have meant the sacrifice of uh, two U.S. Army or yeah, two U.S. Army divisions and one British or was it one British and one U.S. Army division? And then a little bit later, the... Uh, uh, a second U.S. Army division came on. Right, that one. Just as Truscott, Truscott was in charge of the Third Army, they were the one of the original uh, divisions landed at Anzio, along with the British First Division. First Division. Okay. Yeah, and then the American Forty Fifth show. Forty Fifth comes in a little bit, just uh, two or three weeks later. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so we've you know we can't touch on all thirty-eight generals, obviously, unless. Uh, we want to expand this into a 10 hour program, which I don't think we do. Uh, Todd, any more questions? I thought I'd call on see if a few of the uh, members who volunteered some lists might be willing to speak up. Bob Mizwa and Greg Yost. Bob Mizwa, why don't you go first? Yeah, my question is what did the German generals think about the American generals that opposed them in combat? Well, what I've read is that the only American general that the Germans respected was Patton, <laughs> and which is why the Germans couldn't believe that Patton wasn't used at D-Day, since he's the best American general. Surely the Americans will invade wherever Patton's going to be at. Uh, so nothing I've ever read shows the uh, a German showing any respect for anybody but Patton. But, you know, the thing to keep in mind about these American generals is they didn't have to be geniuses. The United States, as long as the United States applied its overwhelming economic power, they're going to win the war. So they don't need genius generals. The Germans needed genius generals. The Americans just needed competent generals who were capable of applying American material superiority, which, which they did. Some, some of the things I've read along that same line is that, you know, the U.S. Army in World War II created sort of uh, the corporate version of the U.S. Army right, the, the take advantage of those resources, right? And, uh, you know, as long as, just exactly what you said, um, as long as we didn't make huge mistakes, right, the results seemed to be inevitable. Now, I'm sure, easy to say 75 years later from the safety of our offices, but 
I think one of the things the Americans did well is you read all these guys' accounts, you never see a case in which an American general was intimidated by the Germans. You know, it's a lot like the Army of the Potomac in the Civil War, where all those guys were just tim- intimidated and terrified of Robert E. Lee. The American generals are professional enough. They're never awed, overawed by the Germans. They just realize if we apply our resources, we can defeat them in a professional manner. So they were a thoroughly professionalized group of people. Greg Yost. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to throw out a few names, and um, they're in two categories. So the first name is in one category. And what was his relationship with Leslie Groves in the States? I th- obviously, we know him from the Manhattan Project, but I think he was actually head of the overall Corps of Engineers. So that's sort of one angle. And the other angle I'm going to throw out here are, are a couple of names. And when you hear the names, you'll realize what, they're, what they all have in common. And technically, they were in the Army. And I'm thinking of uh, Hap Arnold and um, Spots and uh, Jimmy Doolittle and Curtis LeMay. Now, at that time, they were actually in the army. Right. And uh, you didn't, we didn't really talk. I think one of the teenagers actually posted some of their names in the chats earlier. But um, so Corps of Engineers in the States, Leslie Groves and the, what we would today call the Air Force Generals in, in, in the campaigns. Yeah, well, I'll have to say, I don't know much about the Corps of Engineers and Leslie Groves. I know that he was the guy behind the Manhattan Project. And was a great engineer and that's about the limit of it. The Army Air Force guys, you know, I had to make a decision of where I was gonna draw the line. And I just didn't have the time or the energy to look at the Army Air Force guys. I, I think it would be a fascinating book to read if somebody, somebody did it, uh, but it's not gonna be me. So I had to admit those guys, I had to admit the logistical guys back in the States and I just had to limit it to combat commanders from the Corps on up. I just didn't have the time or the, or the energy really to do any more of that and i couldn't have fit it in a book either the book was big enough as it is to start talking about the army air force would have just overwhelmed it but you know the point is a good one uh, uh greg yost about the U- u.s army um you know the u.s army was divided into three pieces the u.s army ground forces the u.s army air forces and the u.s army services of supply and the head of the U.S. Army Service of Supply was a general. I always forget the, the last name. Summerval, Summerall, right? right? Uh, and and he was uh, an exceptional man, as was Le- General Leslie uh, McNair. Uh, no, I say, am, I get, am I getting that name right, Steve? Yeah, um, McNair is the Ground Forces Commander. Ground right? Forces Commander. He was the general, the highest ranking general killed in World War II, killed in a friend, the friendly fire uh, incident in Normandy in uh, June of 44. Maybe it was July, July of 44. July. And I, I've read uh, uh, autobiographies on those men. And, you know, they're, they're the, some of the forgotten names because they weren't the combat guys. Right. But behind the scenes, they were the people that made it all click. And Grove yeah. was not the head of the Corps of Army Engineers. He worked for Summer, Summerville and was really put on the special project of the Manhattan Project in uh, 1940, early 1943, believe it or not. I'll defer to you on that. He is, I, in fact, uh, just to advertise a bit, in February, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not February, in October, I'm doing a lecture at uh, Mount Lebanon High School on the Manhattan Project and the delivery of the atomic bomb featuring Groves. Uh, there's some fantastic biographies of the man. Without and him, he, I don't think there'd, there'd, there'd have been an atomic bomb but not in mid 1945. And we will be live streaming that lecture at the Mount Lebanon Public Library on Wednesday, October 20th, I believe, correct? That's that's correct, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Lisa, I'm curious, I don't know much about Hap Arnold. Uh, Was he a misogynist? Did he not like women, Lisa? (laughs) Lisa Refner is an Air Force veteran. No, it's not misogynist. Um, one of my favorite things that I've learned about over the last few years, and I, I read everything I can about them, is the WASP pilots, the Women's Air Service pilots during World War II. And there were promises made to them yes. that they would be inducted into the Air Force formally. And they were let go summarily with little to no warning with no money to even be able to return home. I mean, the treatment that they were given after everything that they 
sacrificed. There were women who were lost. They tested, they tested uh, planes that the men wouldn't fly or they didn't want the men flying because they didn't want to lose the pilots. And these ladies would take these and they flew every plane imaginable at that time. And he was in the Air Force uh, equivalent of the chief of staff at that time. And he didn't. Now, I'm not saying if he stood up, it could have changed anything. But I just he disappoints me that he didn't stand up a little bit more. So for me, that's a that's a little bit of a hard part for me. Yeah. And he even I mean, he resisted the creation of the WASP, yes, the Women's Air Service pilots from the very beginning. I think it was forced on him. And Eleanor Roosevelt, I think, had something to do with that. Yes, um, she did. Yeah. Fascinating. You know, I, Steve, this book that we're discussing, Marshall and his generals, came out 10 years ago. Um, the the book after that, or the year after your book came out in 2011, Thomas Ricks wrote a uh, very controversial book called The Generals. Thomas Ricks is former correspondent for Washington Post. I think he might be independent now. Uh, he's written several books. They're all extremely well done, extremely well written. But he writes that I think he read. Your, I know that he read your book, and I think he based a lot of his book on your book. He writes that George Marshall had it right. He, you know, ended up firing 10% of the, or demoting or, you know, relieving of duty, 10% of the top generals that he assigned, that he had very stringent requirements. There's accountability at the highest ranks and that that accountability is now missing in the U.S. Army. This is Rick's writing in 2012. And that we need to get back to that kind of holding the, the you know, top brass accountable for poor decision-making, poor leadership, failure at the top, toxic leadership, all that kind of stuff that, uh, that is a problem in the army. Do, do you have a, any comment on Rick's argument? I mean, did you, I assume you read his book? Yeah, I read the book. I thought it was a great book. The thing that struck me the most about that is that he said that whenever you see a high-ranking general relieved after World War II, it's almost always because the civilian side of the military wanted that guy out. It's never the military side that wants to relieve him. It, it's always the civilian side. I thought that was really enlightening. Yes. And he also said, um, Rick's also said, whenever a, a general is relieved after World War II, it's usually because of a public relations problem, a right. gas. Uh, you know, not, not anything substantial having to do with uh, his combat leadership. No, we're yeah. the Petraeus. Right. I right. think Ricks would say that a lot of this, you can trace it back to Vietnam, where those guys were just rotated through. And if you got a guy who's only going to lead a division or corps in Vietnam for a year and they screw up, you don't want to go through the angst of relieving him of his command. You just wait till his year tour is done and then you just ease him out. And I bet that same attitude was prevalent in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Steve, uh, Steve, do you have a book on Vietnam generals in you, you think? Uh, I'm working on that. Is that the next one? Yeah, that's the next one. But give me five years. <laughs> five? We have to wait five years. Yeah. All right. We could do that. We could do that. And you also have a book out now that just came out. Um, Glenn, do you want to talk about that? You haven't read it yet, have you, Glenn? Well, it, it's only been out three days now. Give right. me <laughs> Give me a couple of uh, come on, of Glenn. Get on I, that. <laughs> I'm I'm waiting for it to be discounted on the used bookstores. <laughs> what a cheapskate! Sorry, Steve. Again, Steve's not every get book his... I sell puts two dollars in my pockets. <laughs> yeah, come on. How, I mean, how many kids do you have, Steve? <laughs> Four. <laughs> there it is. Commanding the Pacific, Marine Corps generals in World War II, and I will be reading it very soon. And uh, hopefully, Steve, uh, you'll you'll agree to come back on uh, in the next few months, maybe uh, you know, or late this year or first of the year, and and we can talk about Marine generals. Oh, I'm always happy to give an opinion on anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that'd be fascinating, Marie, and 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 it, and I think it would also be fascinating to you know talk about the role of the Marine Corps in in, in World War II and beyond, and you know. Uh, yeah, I think I think it would be a wonderful bookend to this conversation. How many generals in, in do you uh, 
dissect in the Marine Corps in the Pacific? Not as many, I, obviously. No, I think it's 15. Uh, they had six divisions and two corps and then two commandants during the war. Then I, I asked you this in our discussions, uh, you know, there were 89 U.S. Uh, Army divisions in World War II, six, I believe, uh, Marine Corps divisions. Do I have it right? right? Six, yeah. So um, obviously uh, uh, there probably were something like, you know, in the low hundreds, 110 or 115 U.S. Army division commanders given turnover and many, several, many more of them were dismissed uh, uh, at that level. Yeah. Uh, uh, where can we go? What, what about a book on divisional commanders? That's a, that's a tall order <laughs> looking at that many. I did the Revolutionary War Generals. That was 73. And that 70. was a lot of sorting and researching. So I don't think I'll be able to do uh, 100 and however many division commanders. I think core level is about the limit I can go. Although there's a guy named Jeffrey Parrott. He wrote a book on um, the American Army in World War II in which he discussed a lot of these division commanders. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. But what sort of thread of... of, of um common thread is there that you see from Revolutionary War to Civil War? Obviously, World War I we haven't touched on, right? There's another book. I mean, by the time we're done with you, you'll be 78 oh. years old and still writing books, Steve. Steve, we have your whole career just <laughs> tapped out for you. But do you see a common thread in the U.S. Army throughout well, all of I, our I, wars? I think I, if I can change the question a little bit. Okay. What people look for in a good general, which is what the army would be looking for all the way through it. And what I've discovered is that personality varies. You can have lots of different personalities and be a good general, just like any leader. You've got great leaders who are quiet, withdrawn guys like Bradley, great leaders who are outspoken, boastful guys like Patton, vainglorious guys like MacArthur. But the thing that strikes me the most is that to be successful, and keep in mind, I'm not a leader. I'm just a professor. I've never led anything. But from, and you guys would know more than I do, but a successful leader is somebody who has, the British called it grip. Okay, just this, an understanding of the situation, uh, that you know what you're doing. You know, whenever you watch a great quarterback, and you watch the guy, you can just tell he knows what he's doing and it makes it look easy. Or you hear a preacher give a great sermon and you just it makes it he makes it look easy. And I think generals are the same way or any leader. They just know what they're doing. You can tell immediately that they're comfortable with what they're doing. They have a grip on what they're doing. And I think that's what any army needs to look for. Really, any corporation should look for is people like that. Again, this is coming from somebody who's not a leader, but that's what's impressed me the most. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, it is really interesting. And it sounds like the kind of combination of characteristics that is really hard to predict ahead of time. Um, yes. I, I think Malcolm Gladwell has written an essay about how hard it is to predict, and this is, a, I think, a decent analogy, how hard it is to predict whether a college quarterback is going to make it in the NFL. That it's, it's it, it, and it takes, a, also, my wife is an eighth grade English teacher, what qualities make a good classroom teacher? You kind of have to get that teacher in the classroom. You have to get that quarterback on the field, you know, responding in real time to problems and issues and, and um, uh, to, in order to assess their competence. Yeah, well, we see it in academia. People who on paper you think would be great deans and they turn out to be terrible deans. And there's just doesn't seem to be a way to predict it. Oh, Glenn, I guess you work on that more than we do. I see, I see Lisa Refner laughing. No names shall be. We won't say any names about any dean at Pitt Greensburg or Stephen F. Austin <laughs> State University. But absolutely, it's, it, it seems like some of the most you know, difficult positions in the world require these unique combinations of traits that uh, aren't readily apparent, but kind of come out in the moment in the yeah. crisis. Well, look Look at Abraham Lincoln. Nobody yeah. would have predicted he'd be a great leader. You'd think Jefferson Davis would have been a great leader, but he wasn't. Lincoln, who had nothing you would expect to be a good leader, turned out to be the greatest president we ever had. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I have a, a good friend I work with who's a PhD uh, psychologist and, and, and has a fantastic business working with very senior corporate leaders, helping them pick 
you know, the next corporate leader. And uh, he says, look, it, it's possible to do some assessments. It's possible to try to make more educated decisions. But at the end of the day, you're working with the most complex machine ever created. And that's the human mind and the human character. Yes. And it's just whether it's generals or corporate leaders or deans or college professors, it's a difficult, difficult task. Yeah. And as you know, somebody could be great as a dean and terrible as a provost or great as a VP and then terrible as a, as a president. Right. Right. And you see that in, the, in, in, in World War II and I think generally in, in our military, uh, uh, there are many very, very competent um, you know, battalion, regimental commanders, but that's kind of where they top out. They're better off staying there in the field than getting up to the more senior levels, right? Yeah. Same, same thing in football. How many great quarterbacks become great coaches? Not that many. Not many. Oops. Yeah. Oh, is that Oscar? Oscar's That's telling Oscar. you. Oscar's telling you that we're done, and it is yeah. eight twenty nine. <laughs> It's Steve, it's done because he needs to be let outside. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Professor Stephen R. Tafe, thank you for joining us from, I won't say the town, Texas, from Stephen F. Austin State University in Texas. Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches. Thank you, Ben. Ben Wright from West Texas. He knows how to pronounce it. Um, well, thanks for having me. Hey, this is this is a blast, and what a what a educational evening! Thank you so much for leading this conversation and for writing the book. I hope, I hope we'll see you again. All right. Well, thank you. We'll get thank you, you back for the Marines for sure, Steve. Thanks very much. All right. Hey, good night, everybody. We're going to be right. in uh, Beaver County tomorrow morning for breakfast. We're going to live stream it at eight thirty Eastern. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Have a good night.